going down now over uh, this game bay down here in Miami. And it is, uh, there is something in the air. There is a stillness in the air. There's an excitement in the air. America has spoken. And I'm humbled by the trust and the confidence of my fellow citizens. I don't think you can say that Fahrenheit 9-11 had any sort of electoral effect one way or the other on the campaign. Where it did have an effect was in energizing the base. First the base of the Democratic Party and then in reaction the base of the Republican Party. And this was an election in which there was record voter turnout. People were very, very fired up, energized, agitated. Fahrenheit 9-11 was one of those things that created that. Fahrenheit 9-11 is fine but I believe that it fell into a certain category, namely preaching to the choir. It became almost a secular church where people could pray together, worship together, attack the Bush infidel together. It does illustrate, I think, how deeply upset people on that side get about Michael. And let's face it, people who are upset are far more likely to actually bother to vote and to bother to tell their friends to vote. Did he lose the election? No, I'm not making that argument. Did he do no good for his side in the election? I totally don't think he did any good whatsoever for the John Kerry campaign. Michaels wound up selling himself. And from Bowling for Columbine forward, every time something goes really well for Michael Moore on a personal level, on a fame level and on a bank account level. Fundamentally, things get worse and worse in the country. Four months later, we go back to Flint when we hear Michael Moore is getting the Paul Wellstone Memorial Award. A right-wing book has come out stating Moore's nonprofit foundation had invested in Halliburton stock. And I wanted to ask him about that. So I still can't convince you to do the interview or anything. <laughs> the Canadians are no, so no, good. No, no, no. We're, we're, we're persistent. Ah. We're very persistent. We can't, I mean, can I? What do you want now? I said we can't convince yeah, you maybe to do a sit-down interview at some point. Email you. Not now, not while I'm working. But, you know, I'll be done with this film. And then, you know, maybe we could do something. But that would be... I'm a year away from that. It's still a year away. Yeah. I asked Michael about the allegation that he owned Halliburton stock. Have you seen the back cover of this book you're well, talking that's about? What I'm talking it doesn't about. say anything about a foundation. It makes it look like it's my tax return. Oh, okay. It's photoshopped. Yeah. Look at the book. Oh, it's photoshopped. You don't see anything about any foundation. Oh, there's no foundation. You don't see anything about a foundation. It makes it look like it's my tax return. You but know, your foundation didn't do it either, right? I do not. No. The, I, I, first of all, which foundation are you talking about? Because I'm on the board of directors of a number of charities. Your personal charity. I don't have a personal foundation. Okay. So there's another thing that's okay. wrong. Michael is the president of a private foundation called the Center for Alternative Media and Culture. And according to a 2000 tax return, which can easily be found on the Foundation Center's website, they sold a number of stocks, including the pharmaceutical company Eli Lilly, Halliburton, and the defense contractor Honeywell. What's, what it, it ain't what he Why? I've got more important things to do than to answer crazy right-wingers. The time is short. Yeah. The people know the truth. You can't fool the people. A little while, yes. Long term, no. And nobody will believe that stuff. And they don't believe it. Between all the stuff we've talked about tonight, you got a good 20 minutes. Okay. All okay. right? Just as I walk away, Michael grabs me for a hug. We're Canadian hug. Being Canadian, we don't hug at the drop of a hat. I feel awkward, and I also realize how manipulative it is. But I grin like an unabashed fan anyway. Would you be so kind? The Genesee County Progressive Democratic Caucus presents the first annual Paul Wellstone Memorial Award to Michael Moore. And thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. 
Better than an Oscar. A few months later, I receive a low-quality videotape from a private reception that was held before the award ceremony in Flint. It's awfully frustrating and sad uh, for me to um, come to uh, Flint. It's the first time I've seen Michael look dejected in public. The closest I've seen to Michael having regrets. And we tried to stop the city council from giving tax abatements to judge owners. We talked about this, there's a master plan here to leave this town. And nobody would believe it. And I was just looked at like I was just some coop out on a limb. Then eventually I made that Roger me and I made that movie in the hopes that people here in other towns like Flint would listen. And uh, um, nobody still wanted to listen. If you look at Michael's movie, it looks like the people were apathetic in Flint, Michigan, and they were the furthest thing from apathetic in Flint. The UAW had promised that a massive demonstration would be held on the last day of the factory. Only four workers showed up to protest the plant closing. If Michael had truly captured what was going on in Flint, Michigan, I think other communities across the country would have seen it and said, we can fight back. You show people winning, and then they're going to fight. <laughs> Are there any techniques uh, for storytelling that should not be used in documentary filmmaking? Well, I think, I, think you have, I think you have the right to employ just about anything you can to, to make a good movie that's entertaining, as long as you're telling the truth. He said, you know, I can tell the media anything. If you tell them anything enough, they'll believe it. You were asking for an interview in an audience with Roger, and you were turned down every time? Every time. Uh, we, we wrote, we phoned, we faxed, uh, we tried every means available, but we couldn't get him to respond. In 1990, Premier Magazine discovered that Michael got two interviews with Roger Smith. No one took much notice. We went to the Waldorf Astoria in New York. It wasn't a shareholders meeting, it was just for the people who owned the most shares of General Motors, the corporate investors, Wall Street, and they wanted to show off their new cars and say how great they were and everything. Michael and I got in and got access to Roger Smith. You know, he sat there and answered questions for about 10 or 15 minutes. And it was some great footage because it was, it was Smith answering questions one-on-one -on -one from Michael. The shareholders meeting, which he actually yes. puts in Roger and me, they cut off his mic or something? But and, 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 he actually did talk to Roger Smith. There's, he did talk to Roger Smith, and, and they had a conversation. There was two-page transcript of questions going back and forth between Michael and Roger. That's what was in Premier Magazine. And Michael and I were sitting together, and I had called for Roger Smith to resign. Mr. Chairman, I suggest on Monday, if there's an announcement about Mr. McDonald resigning, that you join in and resign with him. Yeah. Michael then, for the movie, gets into an old theater and cuts and pastes it so it makes it look like Michael was cut off. His microphone wasn't cut off. He was not cut off. I have one question. All right, moved and adjourned. Thank you all very much. You've been a great audience. I would tell you that, I'll tell you that, we never cut him off. He never cut him off. No, it's not our style. I talked to Roger Smith about the shareholders meeting. He wasn't that difficult to find. Why didn't you guys respond to his film when it came out and say that didn't happen? Well, I think the best advice we were getting at that time from people was it's just better not to respond to something as bad as that was. Michael called me in the middle of the night and just, just said basically, can you just say that this doesn't exist? And I said, it exists. There's a transcript of it. I'm, I can't, I'm not going to fall on my sword for you. I said to him, Michael, you, you talked to him twice already. How can you do a movie on something you've done already? He said, well, I can make it look like anything I want. It, it'll just go on a cutting room floor.
And I would get calls from people who were quote unquote pretty high up on the left and they'd say you have to stand up and lie for them. And they'd say the ends justify the means. I said, isn't that what the CIA says? Isn't that, is, isn't that what our military says? It's, it's always the ends justify the means. And you can't live by that, that mentality. If you won't tell the truth because it's bad for the cause, then the cause becomes a fiction, which is exactly what's happened. It's happened with the left in the United States as a whole, and it's happened with Michael Moore. He's quite capable of putting a Mac in Machiavellian. I say that with love, not, not any hate, but he is driven to get things done by any means necessary, and I don't hold that against him. I'll never forget, uh, I was with him shortly after he cut the deal with the Warner Brothers. I said, Michael, you know, the most money you've ever made in your life was like $28,000 a year. And he said, yeah, if you ever uh, see me uh, sitting in a hot tub sipping champagne, come beat me with a baseball bat. You are the same Michael Moore as the one who started doing movies in Flint? Yeah, I am that same person. If I ever stop thinking like that, I'm doomed. And my work will be doomed. I have to stay true to who that person always was and still is. Love Michael Moore, worship him. The culture of celebrity does have something to do with Michael Moore's popularity. And he's very aware of the way that Americans respond to celebrities because he himself has so successfully melded entertainment and politics. It has blurred into one thing for him, and it's really not. America's celebrity driven, and so we create these icons, and then we look to them for answers when so many times they have other agendas which are tied to themselves or tied to other things. Michael! If you want true social change in America, it's got to come from the ground up. It's not going to come from celebrities. And it was always about him rather than the movement. Everyone wanted to hold Michael up there as the savior of the left when he wasn't trying to save the left. He was just trying to create an image for himself. And that's the saddest thing is who we put our faith in. We follow leaders too much. We don't follow what's in our own heart and soul enough. Over a hundred lovely exotic dancers. You will have a great time today at Nathan Jay's, home of the centerfolds. And listen, you can justify it to your spouse by saying, hey, I went there for the dollar lunch. Mr. Boyce, we actually allowed into the Hall of Fame while he sat on the selection committee of the Hall of Fame. But we overlooked that. According to uh, Roger, Roger Moore, when he did the movie, Roger, Roger, me. Roger Smith. No, I'm talking Roger Moore, the, the Michael filmmaker. Moore. Michael Moore. There you go. Michael Moore. Michael Moore and Roger Smith. I get James Bond. I get James Bond and Michael Moore mixed up all the time. Uh, everyone does. Exactly. <laughs> I have two hats, a Detroit Tigers and a Detroit Red Wings hat. All other hats are either forced on me at events uh, like this or they are sent to me and my wife throws them away. Uh -huh.